I'm making a lot of edits because we're now entering the shamatha section. It's an area where I have some interest for a long time. Quite a bit of interest, actually, for a long time. There it is. Okay. So, we'll just cover a little bit. We just have 10 minutes this afternoon. But we're in serenity. Serenity 2.2.3.3.1. Serenity. So we go to the text. Since This is the commentary. Since that is the case... As, and so, as stated, this is the system in which one seeks the view on the basis of meditation. So I explained that earlier. It's exactly the approach of Padmasambhava as he articulates in Natural Liberation. Since that is the case, what is the way to cultivate serenity first? So he said, view or meditation. Now we know just like Padmasambhava, what he means by meditation, which of course is a great big term that can mean all kinds of things, in this context you first cultivate the view and then seek meditation, or vice versa, he's suggesting, I'm suggesting, go for meditation first, achieve meditation, and then go for the view. And now we know exactly what he's referring to, serenity, and that's his translation. I'm not going to change it. For shamatha, it's a perfectly good translation. Since that is the case, what is the way to meditate on, or to, I should say, cultivate? I'm not gonna, you're not meditating on serenity. Uh, so I'm going to change that right now. What is the way to cultivate serenity first? Shamatha first. There are preliminaries and the main practice. So there's a, there's a familiar refrain. So preliminaries. The exalted Maitreya explains. So now we're going down to the nuts and bolts. What are the co- necessary cause and conditions for bringing about the successful practice of shamatha? And the first of all, as long as you're embodied, you have to be meditating someplace. So what kind of place to meditate in? The exalted Maitreya explains in what sort of place do the wise practice? It should have easy access, easy access to supplies, basic requisites of life, food, and so forth. A pleasant environment. I love that. Um, I kind of find this pleasant myself. I don't know about you, but (laughs) it's kind of like, it's it's okay. It's really okay. One that's pleasing to the mind. When I look out on this magnificent landscape here, I don't look out and say, how much does it cost per acre? How much could I buy? You know. I'm not thinking that. It would be, of course, nice to have up there for a retreat center, but in terms of, boy, I wish I owned some of this property. It's like, well, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't invite that. I don't think it is for any of you either. Like, boy, I'd like to buy that valley. valley. The, the beauties of nature don't tend to arouse. Well, then I think about La Salle. All that belongs to France. Okay. okay, there are some real weirdos, primarily from Europe, that they would just say, well, that belongs to me. Okay, but for normal people. Uh, being in a pleasant environment, just as one of my beloved and revered lamas uh, stated, Sakidamala, the woman lama, uh, she was asked, what is the role of beauty? Very, it was asked by, by a Westerner, this kind of question, it just doesn't come up in the Tibetan tradition. And she, was asked what, and he was, and she was asked, what is the role of beauty in spiritual practice? As in a pleasant environment, the beauty is of nature. And she said, oh, beauty is so important. It makes the heart happy. You know? And so at its best, that's exactly what it did. It doesn't arouse attachment, craving, clinging. Look at the, the great monasteries of the Christian tradition and the Buddhist tradition. Look in Japan, look in China, look in Tibet and so forth and elsewhere. And you find the hermitages tended to be in really gorgeous spots. Right? With great views. So for good reason. Pleasant environment. Good land. It should be a healthy environment. Not one where you can easily catch malaria or dengue fever, uh, Zika, or hepatitis and cholera and typhoid and parasites and worms. <sighs> <sighs> oh, yes. So be in a healthy place. You know, Good friends. Good friends are not just good chums, but people who are really good for you and you're good for them in supporting each other in spiritual practice and not getting each other's way. So a yogic community, a contemplative community, is a very loose-knit community where if someone gets ill, the other ones are right there to help him or her. But they're not in each other's face. They're not there to socialize. They're there to, the, to, to plumb the depths of the mind to gain realization. 
and they're there just we need it to support each other. So it's a very lightweight, very sincere, very heartfelt connection of spiritual friendship, but it's absolutely not a socializing community. So that's what a, a, a good a conducive environment is. And there should be the requisites for yogic bliss. Okay? Requisites, well, all the inner qualities. Um, these are described next, and that is abiding with pure morality. There's the first one. Pure morality. You must have pure ethics, otherwise you may as well go home. Uh, abiding with pure morality in the location thus described, with few desires, few desires for anything you don't have, and content with what one has. So those are really crucial. If you miss those, you may as well go home. Be, have few desires for what you don't have, and be content with what you do have. One must rely on the branches or collections of serenity. These are the requisite conditions giving rise to serenity. And definitely accomplish the six preliminary practices. Okay? So, these are the Jove Yanlatu, Jove Yanlatu, or Jochudu. And these are not unique to any one of the six schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, these are preliminary practices, preparatory practices, but I was introduced to this maybe 30, 35 years ago. And it, what I really liked about these is that these are not something you get through with, you get finished with, and now you can get a move on to the main, main event. These pre- preparatory practices, these you continue practicing all the way till, up till, you know, up till not including you're enlightened. And they are, and you'll have this on, your, uh, on the website very shortly. Here they are. And listen to this. This is just now, this becomes part of your routine until you're enlightened. Sweep and clean the room. <laughs> clean up after yourself. <laughs> it's not like mom. You know. Clean your room. <laughs> Don't be meditating in a big sigh. Come on, kid. Grow up. You're not a teenager anymore. Sweep and clean your room and arrange the altar. Create a sacred space. So you're not just meditating in a hotel room or just some place where you happen to sit down. Arrange the altar. Create a sacred space. That this is like, as neuroscientists have their laboratories and musicians have their conservatories, so does contemplative need a sacred space. Arrange the altar. A place that gives you a, a focal point for your devotions, icons, representatives of your objects of refuge. Arrange the altar. Make offerings on the altar, such as light, as in candles, food, incense, water bowls, and so on. Sign of devotion. It's symbolic, but symbols can be very, very powerful. So, sacred space. Sit in a comfortable position and examine your mind. Okay? Sit, and if you can't sit in a comfortable position, then lie down in a comfortable position. You should be comfortable. Examine your mind. Check your mind. What's the mind you're bringing to the practice? Do breathing meditation to calm your mind. This can be simply mindfulness of in and out breathing, which is widely practiced as a preliminary exercise in Tibetan Buddhism, like counting 121 breaths. Or as we'll see shortly, there's also a ninefold breathing exercise, kind of a pranayama exercise that you can do. So balance your, balance your mind with, with breathing, either the natural breathing of mindfulness of breathing or the ninefold breathing we'll get to shortly. Then establish a good motivation, renunciation, bodhicitta, that would be good. After that, take refuge and generate, so get a good motivation and then go on beyond that. Uh, to take your refuge and generate the altruistic intention by reciting the appropriate prayers, or refuge in bodhicitta. Okay, so now you're creating, you're creating a space, a mental space, that's loving, that's gentle, that's safe, in which you can enter fearlessly. You have a sense of refuge, just have a sense of safety, but also benevolence. This is all imbued. Your practice now becomes imbued with bodhicitta. The next one, visualize the merit field, that is the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, um, the great Bodhisattvas, the Arhats, your gurus, and so forth and so on, those in whom you're taking refuge. Visualize the merit field with the spiritual mentors, the gurus, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and so forth. You can include Dharmapalas, Viras, Dakinis, and so forth, Arhats. If this is too difficult, if you find it difficult to visualize sometimes the very elaborate uh, field of merit, then visualize Buddha Shakyamuni Buddha and consider him the embodiment of all Buddha's Dharma and Sangha. So just one, the synthesis of everything. And if you're practicing Vajrayana, well then, the Buddha is indivisible from your own guru. 
offer the seven limb prayer. We've covered that already in Shower of Blessings. There are many, many versions of it. That's a nice one, but there are many others equally good. So here it is. Here's just the core preliminary practices, the, 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 the homage, the offering, the purification, the taking delight in virtue, the requesting that the wheel of Dharma be turned, requesting the light ones not pass away into nirvana but remain, and final dedication of merit. I mean, that's just absolutely core for accruing merit and purifying obscuration. So this is a keeper. You don't see how many times do I have to do it. Just keep on doing it until you're enlightened. Offer the seven limb prayer and by and the, the mandala. Offer the mandala by reciting those prayers. There's corresponding liturgy. Make requests to the lineage, the lineage of spiritual mentors or gurus for inspiration by reciting the requesting prayer. So these are prayers of supplication. Prayers of supplication. So this will all be on the on the uh, on the website very shortly. So just a tiny bit more. So seated on a platform, kadoots, but there we are. So one must rely on the branches and definitely accomplish the six preliminary practices. There they were. And uh, you, you, if you Google it, you can find there's a, there's a very nice presentation of this in various ways. But the Gelongma Tutin Chudun, one of my old chums since we were both like 14 years old, um, she has, she's a very fine nun, a good scholar, a wonderful teacher. And uh, she has a nice entry on this on the, on the web. You can easily find her name and, this, and the oh, six uh, preparatory practices. Very nice. So I just gave a the concise version there. So, so then we go to the... Um, we go to the root text, seated on a platform, so this would normally be a cushion, conducive to meditation. It's a platform, it's an interesting term, it's, a, it's an accurate term. Um, then, your body seated on, seated on a platform conducive to, con, to contemplation, your body in the seven-point posture. The seven-point posture, this is classic. The seven-point posture, sitting cross-legged, it's the posture of Varochana. They are, very briefly, this too will be on the website, very shortly here. Uh, your legs in the Vajra, the full lotus position, or the, or the half lotus, or it can be the bodhisattva position, seated cross-legged. Your hands in the mudra of meditative equipoise, left hand beneath, right hand, hand, on, hand on top, thumbs touching. Wisdom, method, union of method, wisdom and method. So the second one is the mudra. Third, your back should be straight. Fourth, your jaws. Uh, should be relaxed. Your jaw should be the jaw muscles should be relaxed. Tongue against the palate. That's four. Uh, tongue against the, just lightly touching the palate holds the saliva in the mouth so you don't drool. Uh, head tilted forward just slightly, a slight incline of the head. Eyes slightly open. Gaze directed downwards, very gently downwards. Shoulders level and relaxed. So there's no notion of hunching up like a vulture. This is the classic teaching. So shoulders will level. Don't be tilted and relaxed. So that'll be all sent out momentarily, right after we're finished here. So your body in the seven-point posture, there it is. If you're comfortable. If you're not, then remember Upatisa, the Arhat. Supine position. Good. Walking, standing. Not good for Shamata, good for Vipassana. So be somewhat flexible, but this clearly is the classic instruction. Clear away stale breath. The, the res- residual stale prana, or breath, through the nine-round breathing, distinguishing well be- between... So there's that. The nine-round breathing. Uh, there's a very... I'm not going to explain it. It's very simple. And you can read it, and you can understand it perfectly from the, re- from the, uh, from the PDF that I just sent out this morning. So that's online here for our website. I just plucked it off the, off the Internet. It was really, really good. I thought I have nothing better to say than that. So just read it. It's not indispensable, but it's widely taught, and it can just kind of clear out the whole system. Not like achieving shamatha, but it's a good start. And then distinguishing well between clear and sullied awareness. So as soon as you start, recognize with introspection, is your mind clear, or is it sullied, is it a bit, bit vague, dull, and what have you? If it is sullied, you might want to say, well, maybe I, maybe I can just go ahead and meditate and clear it away. Maybe you should go out for a walk, or have a cup of tea. Or something like that. Okay? So, that's that. So we'll continue. So now we're, we've really entered into his explicit teachings on shamatha within the Mahamudra tradition. And Penjana Mochi definitely, very clearly, explicitly draws strongly on the Kagyu tradition for this presentation of shamatha.
So I was introduced to this, I told you, 40 years ago, deeply inspired by it, practice it. And this, as I recall, like the first time I've ever taught it. So hopefully it'll be helpful. But the transmission, the commentary there is there. I've been authorized to teach it, so that's where this is coming from. Thanks to Gishanapta. So, so enjoy evening. <laughs>